five questions with an insider. Getting to know this week's opponent. A repeat guest and Nightline friend joins us to preview Saturday's UCF game at the Houston Cougars. Jay Saunders is a longtime journalist who's covered Houston football for years. Jay, welcome back. It's good to be back. Thanks for having me. Looking at the standings, we see Houston is trailing Navy, Memphis, and Tulsa in the AAC's West Division. Quite a fall from grace after knocking off Oklahoma and uh, and climbing into the top ten. What's gone wrong with them? You know, that's the that's the sixty four thousand dollar question, uh, and the and the thing is, I, I'm not sure anyone has the answer, and that starts with. Uh, head coach Tom Herman. You know, he he said uh, after the SMU game, and then again in his press conference Monday that he's the head coach. The buck stops here. All the normal cliches when your team is losing, when they're expected to win. Um, you know, they they've been hit by the injury bug uh, pretty bad, but at the same time, you know, you look at the. You look at the defense, and that's I think where you really need to start. You know they're giving up 38 points a game in the last three weeks. You know 45 against Navy, uh, 31 in a win against Tulsa, and then 38 last week against SMU. Uh, not exactly what uh, what Houston fans have been used to uh, the last couple of years with that uh, third war defense. All right, talk to us about the Houston's offense, in particular dual-threat quarterback Greg Ward Jr., who's thrown for 13 touchdowns with another six on the ground. Greg Ward is still Greg Ward. Uh, you know, it's it certainly isn't uh, – he certainly hasn't been, you know, the the problem, you know, for, for this Houston team. As you mentioned, dual-threat. He, you know, he's a guy that – you know, very similar to, you know, if people are looking nationally at Lamar Jackson, you know, he can take off on on, on a busted play or design quarterback run at any time. But what is really, you know, what is really developed in his game is the ability to pass the ball. He's he's an efficient passer. Uh, you know, his his completion percentage is you know almost seventy percent, which is unheard of in, in the in the college game. You know, a lot of that has to do with their their up tempo style, and you know some some of the short passes. But you know, it's 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 not like this is a dink and dunk offense. Greg Ward can can drop the ball on a dime forty yards down the field. Well, that leads me right into the next question: Who should the Knights fans fear at wideout for the Cougars? You know, again, this is this is an area where you know I mentioned um, the injury bug, uh, and then also replacing guys. Uh, from a year ago, you know, last year Greg Ward's favorite target was Demarcus Ayers, who uh, is, uh, you know, n- no longer in Houston. Chance Allen was supposed to be the guy who, you know, was you know what was the was the new go-to. He actually came in from uh, as a transfer from Oregon. So Chance Allen, Stephen Dunbar uh, is another uh, you know big play threat. He's caught. Uh, you know, he's caught 36 passes, but the guy who's kind of stepped up as of late is a guy by the name of Lionel Bonner. Uh, he's the leading receiver both in uh, receptions and yards, and also a bit of a big play, th- uh, a bit of a big play threat. Uh, but you know, this is a spot where they've had you know a couple of injuries, and you know, it seems like at times Ward isn't on the same page as some of his guys, but Dunbar especially is is someone who. Um, who UCF fans should should pay particular attention to. What about running backs? Running backs, you know, I hate to keep going back to, to injuries, but Duke Catalan was supposed to be the guy who came in and take over for Kenneth Farrow. Uh, Catalan was a transfer from Texas. Uh, he has been banged up most of the year, uh, has has only started uh, two of their, uh, you know, two of their games. Um, and, and so it's, you know, getting him back in the groove would certainly help Houston because basically right now their run game is Greg Ward. Uh, you know, they've they've had you know some running back by committee. Uh, they've tried to you know do some alternative things to uh, to 
make up for the loss of, of Catalan, but without him, it's like I said, it's it's pretty much a, a running back by committee situation, and and not an ideal situation when you've got a guy like Ward who, uh, you know, if without the threat of true run game, you know, you don't have some of that read option, you know, possibilities and the play action possibilities, and that makes Greg Ward a little bit more one dimensional, which is exactly. Um, what teams, you know, when you're game planning against Houston, want to do is you you want Greg Ward to be a pocket passer. Not that he's not a good passer, but without that extra threat, it's tougher for Houston. Well, you've pretty much said it right there. You know, Houston is is really injured, obviously. Uh, you know, and that's I'm sure causing a lot of the problems that they're having with uh, these American teams. Talk about Houston's defense a little bit. They're tough against the run. They're sixth in the nation, giving up uh, just 98 yards per game. Overall, Houston is 13th. What should we know about this unit? Ed Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to, to, to me, you know, he's, he's a uh, Ed Oliver stud defensive lineman. Freshman was Houston's first uh, five-star recruit in um, I don't know how I many believe years first in the American as well. First five star period in the American, and maybe even in the group of five. He's uh, he, he like I say, he's freak of nature. They weren't sure exactly how much he would play, how effective he would be right away. Uh, but Ed Oliver is a true um, is a true disruptor, a true playmaker. Uh, he has been he has been outstanding. Uh, the secondary has been you know again they lost a ton of talent from a year ago, and I think that that's starting to to show a little bit. Linebackers also very you know also very strong, um, but uh, it, you know the some of those stats you know that you mentioned are very are very impressive, but when you look at the last, when you look at the last three weeks, uh, you you don't see the same defense as you did against um, Oklahoma, and that you saw against some of the lesser teams like, say, a Lamar or a um, or Texas State, where they were able to you know fatten up their fatten up their stats. The last three weeks have been have been pretty brutal uh, for this defense. After peaking as high as uh, number six in the rankings, Houston has come back to earth with losses to Navy and the upset loss at SMU last weekend. How much of a, a distraction has all of the talk uh, of head coach Tom Herman leaving for greener power five pastures and uh, the never ending talk of the Big 12 expansion been on the Cougars? I think it, it, it has to be. You know, and I, now, I obviously, know. there's talk of possibly uh, Tom Herman leaving for Texas. Uh, that's the latest talk. I don't know how long it's been since you've been an 18 to 22 year old, but there is no way that if you are a college kid, you you don't know what's going on with the talk of the Big 12 and the talk of your team going 13 and 0, and then pile on. You know the the coaching stuff and the Big Twelve stuff, and I, you know, Tom Herman when he came in, he had this 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 mantra, and he still stays with it of one and zero. We want to go one and zero every week. We don't look at the big picture. We look at what's right in front of us. That's that's impossible to do when you have, you know, essentially three huge stories staring you right in the face, and one of them being the coach that you signed on to play for possibly not being there next year. You can preach one and oh all you want, but every time a story pops up about Tom Herman possibly going to Texas and PS, that's probably going to happen. Uh, I, I, I don't see a scenario where Charlie Strong lasts long at UT and there are only so many times Houston can pony up a contract extension that Texas can't match. Um, Longhorns have deep, deep pockets, and their boosters have deep, deep pockets. And, you know, it's only a matter of time before Tom Herman leaves Houston. I know Cougars fans don't want to hear that, but it's going to happen. Um, And, you know, when you're – 
like I said, when you're a player, when you're a college kid, you, you can't get away from that. It's, it, it has to be a distraction. I don't care, you know, what they, what they say, what the coach says, um, that has to be somewhere in their mind, whether it's on the field during game day, on the field during practice, or completely away from the facility. Yeah, I think that this Big 12 thing, and I know we've talked to you about this before, uh, this Big 12 thing was a huge distraction for everybody. And I think it's unfortunate the way that the Big 12 handled all of this by stringing everybody along and then being like, oh, we're not going to do it, you know. So everybody spent a bunch of money and a lot of time and a lot of thought going into all this, and and I'm pretty upset with the way that it all turned out. What are your thoughts on that? It was an absolute debacle. The Big 12, (laughs) the Big 12 just can't get out of its own way. Um, you know, the, the writing was on the wall years ago when Nebraska left and then A&M left and Missouri and Colorado, uh, it, you know, they, they, they screwed up by letting those teams go. They screwed up by not getting Louisville. And then this process of, will we expand? Won't we expand? We're going to invite all these teams to, you know, share a, um, you know, share a presentation with us, and then we're going to um, – it was just – it was so poorly handled. And, you know, like you said, I, I feel for some of these teams, like a like a Houston and a UCF, who, you know, you can make the argument about whether or not they're a Power 5 program, but what you can't argue with is that they were um, – you know they were they were played for puppets, and it, it, it you know the Big Twelve is is just an absolute dumpster fire and a and a Hindenburg waiting to happen. Uh, but this was uh, this was the latest example of uh, of the Big Twelve completely not know not knowing what's going on in the real world. Yeah, I've been saying for quite a while, and and people can go back and listen in shows, I've said that the Big 12, uh, my analogy was it was a boat that the plug was about to be pulled out of and it was going to sink. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to be, honestly, I, I'm, I'm glad that this didn't happen. Uh, not because of the money. Obviously, UCF, Houston, all those, play, all those schools need the money of the Power Five. But, you know, who knows where you'll be in five years if it did happen. Uh, I don't want to be a part of that sinking ship. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and, you know, I have a lot of uh, conversations with, with Houston fans on Twitter. And, and I've been asking them, all along, why on earth would you want to be part of this? And the only answer they can come up with is the money. Well, you know, that's fine. The money's going to run out eventually. The Big 12 is going to run out eventually. Even if they expanded in, you know, two to four years when the when the grant of rights is done and the TV contract is up, uh, you know, don't think for a second that Texas and Oklahoma, even if the Big 12 expanded, wouldn't be looking for greener pastures. And so uh, it's a it's a blessing in disguise that these teams did not get brought into that that boat with the, you know, to use your analogy, you know, the the boat with uh, with with the plug being pulled out. You know, I, I don't remember a lot of people. Um, I don't remember a lot of people. Uh, trying to get off the lifeboat and back onto the Titanic. Absolutely. Hey, uh, so this this conversation has gone a little bit farther than than just about Houston, but that's fine. Let's talk a little bit real quick about what you think about the American and what they can do to push themselves. Uh, Mike Oresco, the commissioner of the American, has said that he wants to make the American the, the power six what can he do and what does he need to do and can he make that happen? No. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there's, there's your short and blunt answer to that question. No, he can't. Um, he can, he can talk about it all he wants. You know, they, you know, they can, you know, a lot of the chatter out there is, Oh, let's try to bring in Boise state. Let's try to bring in BYU. Let's try to bring in San Diego state. Um, it, <laughs> It's the old quality versus quantity argument. Uh, you know, by adding some of those teams, you're not, you still don't have a a top ten, 
top 15 program. It's, it's almost like the, the, the big East all over again, where they just threw a bunch of teams, you know, threw a bunch of teams in and said, let's try to be a power conference. The big East became kind of a, you know, kind of a, a joke. You know, when it came, when it came time to deciding, you know, what, you know, what teams are going to be, you know, in the, in the BCS. And uh, I, I really, I just, without a major program, and I know the Houston's and the Cincinnati's and the Memphis's and the UCF's are going to scoff at me not calling them major programs, but if they were major programs, they'd already be in a P5. Um, by throwing a bunch of teams that don't get national attention for one reason or another into the pot, doesn't make a power six conference okay well i understand well i understand where you're coming from well hopefully the american you know in the coming years the teams in the american can can get up into those rankings you know can can do this houston has shown that it is possible they just have to remain there uh so hopefully in the next couple of years you know something happens and we can we can make a little bit more of a uh I, I guess uh, we can shake the waters a bit and make them talk about us a little bit more. So I guess that would be the thing to do. And I, and I think part of it is you – and one of the reasons that Michael Risco is pushing so hard for this is because I think he sees some of the writing on the wall. I, I do see the Big 12 eventually dissolving, and there is going to be a a major – Shake up in you know, where these teams go, who goes with Texas, who goes with Oklahoma, where are they going, and you know the American as, as being that 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 tier at the top of the tier, right under the current P five. Uh, you know they're they're going to be a target to get plucked uh, once uh, you know, once the Big Twelve you know dissolves. In my opinion, eventually, and and people start uh, um, panicking and try to figure out where they're going to go. Jay Saunders, thank you so much, man. Greatly appreciate. It. I, I always enjoy talking to you, and uh, hopefully, we'll be able to do it again. My pleasure. And I just have to, I have to say, my absolute favorite story of this past week was UCF leaving the the conflict trophy on the field at UConn. It made me laugh. <laughs> so much and it was such a ridiculous uh thing to begin with and the fact that coach frost and the, and the team just left it out there on the field was absolutely my favorite story of the college football weekend yeah you know that was kind of a weird thing anyway of course with bob diaco making that trophy anyway uh and i understand <laughs> he was trying to work up his team i understand that but there has to be two parties in a rivalry, and, and we don't consider UConn a rivalry, and uh, Scott Frost really doesn't consider them a rivalry, and, and we have basically one rival. I think we have a few more, uh, but there are one rival really being USF across uh, the state there, and you know, so he wants to focus. If there's going to be a rivalry game, focus on that one and play every other game like it's every other game in, in the year, you know, and try to win those games. So I, I just loved it. So I, I had to mention that before I got off with you guys. It's awesome. No, it, it's great. It's it's a good thing. Did you see the trophy? I mean, <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty hideous. It, uh, you know, I'm a, uh, uh you know, and it, it's you make up these these trophies, and you know the Big Ten is is guilty of it. And you know, as as a joke, uh, Nebraska and Minnesota uh, made up the five dollar bits of broken chair trophy, and uh, it's become a, a huge joke between those two teams. And uh, you know, making making light of you know, making light of rivalries. And, and I, I, I just thought that the UCF thing was just outstanding. And it got national news. So, you know, hey, there you, there that's, you go. that's a good thing <laughs> when they can talk about you. I say any publicity is good publicity because it gets your name out there no matter what. So I don't know. Anyway, thank you, Jay, very much. We enjoy talking to you, like I said, and uh, hopefully we'll get to do it again. My pleasure anytime. There are so many ways to connect with Nightline. You can like us on Facebook at Nightline Podcast. 
or follow us on Twitter at UCF underscore Nightline. Check out our website at www.ucfnightlinepodcast.com for recruit spotlights, archived episodes, and more. Or, of course, you can always call us at 407-401-9184. That's 407-401-9184. Listen whenever and wherever you are on YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iTunes, or tune in. Go Knights and charge on!